Hello and welcome to Off the Brawl on Off the Ball. With me as ever is Phil Egan and Simon Maguire. Later in the show, we'll be joined by former Cruiserweight Champion of the World, Dan McCrory, to preview this Saturday's four bell clash between Alexander Yusik and Tony Bellew. Before that, though, I'm delighted to say we're joined in studio by one of the most recognisable faces in, around the Irish boxing scene, Packy Collins. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having me here. How's life? Good. Busy. Just back from America again. I seem to be uh, spending more time over there than I am here, so... Um, no, it, it's good. It's, it's, you know, you have years. I've had one in the last years, one terrible year, but I, I, I treat that as a positive. We go back, we learn, and then we move on. And it's been a really good year this year, and uh, now, you know, how things have changed over the last two, three weeks with Spike and, you know, other fighters I've got, um, it's going to end with a, with, a, with a lot of wins and a lot of good, mm. a lot of positives now. We can start with the new year then, getting ready. Are you looking forward to Castle Bar? Yeah, I am actually, yeah. There's been a, there's a few Spanish thrown the work up the last couple of days you probably saw with, 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 with uh, uh, Spike being announced to fight in, in Sheffield. Sheffield on the Cal Brook card. It's funny, Cal sent me a, a text message. He says, listen, he's been looking for Spike to go spar him. So uh, Spike's just back from the camp. He's just got me, and he didn't want to go away from home again. He's been away from his family. So there was no re reason for Spike to go, but Cal wants to get him out there because Spike would be a good spar for him. And he sent me a message as he's saying, now that Spike's on our card, he should come out and train me. And I was like, what's he talking about? <laughs> you know, about I hadn't seen the fight posters either, but you know, just to clear it up, uh, I met with, with Eric Gomez in Boston three weeks ago, and he's the president of the Golden Boy promotion. And I said to Eric, you know, what's the plan for Spike? He said, listen, Spike is still part of our team. We've got big plans from him. He will fight for a world title in the next 12 months. Um, and he said we'd get him out before Christmas. So in the background, I spoke to Ken, I spoke to Eric, and I told him that uh, I'd like to get Spike on the card in, in, in Mayo because we have so many fights on that night, it would make sense. Plus, Irish public hasn't seen a fight in a while either. So this is okay, let's make that fight. But what they forgot to mention was that they already spoke to Eddie Hearn, Eric Gomez had, and asked would he put Spike on in Sheffield. So they forgot to relay the message to Eddie Hearn that Spike's not actually now fighting in Sheffield. So I spoke to Eddie, I see Eddie was kind of cool about it. He says, you know, just sort it out among yourselves and let us know what's happening. If, if you need to spot for Spike, he's there. And if he's not, that's cool. So, you know, that's... So he's, in, he's going to the West. Yeah. The and West. We'll probably come back to that card later on. But just in terms of your own story, Packy, it's obviously a really interesting one and people will be well aware of the fighting tradition with yourself and Steve. But it goes back a bit further, doesn't it, with your dad and your uncle as yeah, well? Yeah, well, well my, my father boxed um, all my uncle's box. And I think in them days... You know, a working class kind of uh, situations. Most people in Dublin, most men box because you, have, you could have a share at the club. Yeah. I always remember my first memories of Phoenix Box Club. You go have a share. So, and some are good, some aren't good. But my father done really well. He won a couple of titles. His brother Terry Collins also uh, had a lot of good wins. He was a prize for it too. He actually his claim to fame was beat one of the Cray twins. Um, so that was my father's side. But my father's side had friends called the O'Rourke's, Jack O'Rourke and Roddy O'Rourke and Pat O'Rourke, who also boxed. And that was my mother's brother, and that's how my mother and father met through mm. the boxing circle. So my uncle Jack O'Rourke, I think, in total he won like 26 Irish national titles from juvenile up to senior. He was like middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight champion. He'd be, you know, it's funny, I sat with my uncle Jack one day watching um, an old video of George Farmer win the Olympic Games, and... The German that Jack O'Rourke fought in the final, and the Italian that Jack, or sorry, the German that George Foreman beat in the final, and the Italian that he beat in the semi-final. Michael Jack had beaten both prior to this, and uh, so it, it, there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of history there. Mm. And in terms of your own boxing career, like you would have turned pro quite early. It was it late teens? Or? Well, I was actually playing football. I played with Stella Maris, and I was playing with Dingley Knight and Carbon. And I was quite a good footballer, and um, centre forward. forward. I was a good centre forward. I wasn't dirty like my brother Roddy, but I was a, <laughs> you know, I, I, I kept it ruled. But uh, centre forward I played, um, and about 15 years of age, 14, 15, I went up to Mansfield when Roddy was playing over there. And, uh, it, you know, it was a great setup, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was pretty tough even at that young age. Like, you trained really hard, and I was enjoying it, but I missed my boxing. I love my boxing and I was putting the work in over there and what was happening was I was working hard and I could see guys in the team just weren't pulling their way. So I kind of got to the stage, you know what, what I put into it, I'll get out of. And I just decided at that age, 16, I actually stopped playing football even then. 
Um, I just stuck with the boxing and, you know, I, I had about 120 fights as an amateur, but I was always, as a, as a young age, like I lived in, in America when I was 13, my brother Steve, when he was fighting at the Petronini, so I was around Marvin Hagler. I didn't appreciate then who he was, but I knew he was someone special and all these other great fighters. So from the time of 13 years of age, up until probably seven years ago, I spent most of my life in America, in Brockton, being around all these great people and great fighters, and it just grew from there. Mm. And you were back in Boston a couple of weeks ago um, at the TD Garden, but you would have fought at the old Boston Garden, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, funny enough, uh, my brother Steve was to defend his middleweight title that he won against Chris Poyer um, in the old Boston Garden. It was to be the very last fight also, because really? it was being pulled down like a month later. And he withdrew from the fight within a week of it happening because uh, he picked up a virus out there. Um, so he was pulled off the card and then the whole show changed. It was my debut. And I just got messed about because of my brother Steve having to pull out. They just messed me about and they made me, I was supposed to be the first fight. I became a swing bow, so I was getting ready from like three o'clock that day. And the main event was Dana Rosenblatt at 11 o'clock. And then when his fight <coughs> was over, they were, they were saying like, that's it, no more fights. But there was a big Irish crowd had bought tickets originally to see my brother Steve. There was a lot of Irish media had travelled out. Mm. So they were saying, hang on a minute, you know, this kid is trained for a fight, let him fight. And Michael Buffer, the great thing was, I just spoke to Michael in Boston about it. Uh, Michael Buffer had just announced the main event. So he stayed in the ring oh. and he announced my fight too. So, ah, brilliant. so it turned out because I was on so late and because I was on after Dana Rose, but it was actually the very last fight ever in the old Boston Garden. And probably the quickest knockout too. It was, it was <laughs> only a couple of seconds. Right? Or I always remember when I hit the guy, it was my debut. I trained for like three months for this fight and I hit the guy and he fell over. And it was like, I was trying to pick him up. I was like, <laughs> I fight. And it was a beautiful. And I actually almost got disqualified because I was trying to pick him up to fight him. But, uh, <laughs> So I said to Michael Buffer, you know, we're, we're in the hotel right direct across from the new TD Garden. I said, Michael, you know, all them years ago, you actually announced my fight and then we're back again. And He's a good guy, Mike. He's a good memory too. He remembers it. Yeah. He says, it was only. And even with the, like, there's a bit of a boxing boom in the UK at the moment, but I saw it like Tommy Coyle was on that card and he was speaking the whole build up about his dream to fight in America. There's still something magical about fighting over there, isn't there? You know, it's funny, uh, I've, I've never been in Tommy's company, I've never met him personally, but I've always liked him. He's always been that kind of blood and guts fighter, mm. avoids nobody. And he did mention at the press conference that uh, his dream is just to fight in America, mm. just to fight in America. And he said to meet Mickey Ward because he was his hero and he, you know, he wants to have that kind of Ward Gatti kind of fight. I know Mickey well, so I was sitting with Mickey, like watching some of the fights prior to Tommy Coyle's. And I said, Do me a favour, so would you come down and I want to meet, introduce you to somebody? And I knew it would mean a lot to Tommy Coyle. As I say, I don't know the guy, but I just knew it would mean something to him. Mm -hmm. And Mick came down and introduced him to him, and he was so happy. And then it turned out uh, Ryan Kozelski, who Tommy Coyle fought, is actually a friend of mine. Oh, right. I, I, brought, I brought Ryan to box as an amateur from America to Ireland all them years ago. So when that fight was made, I said, this is going to be a tough fight for Tommy. Now, Ryan did move up two weights to fight him. And the fight was kind of, it wasn't short now, it was enough time. But Eddie Hearn asked, what's Ryan like? I said, he's tough and he can fight. And, and he proved he could. And it was a fantastic fight. But uh, what that will do now for Tommy Coyle is it will bring us the interest of the American public now want to see him back fight again. He's fan friendly, isn't he? He's fan friendly and, and he's a lovely guy, but he's, he's a good, good guy. Mm. Just moving on to that um, fight in America point. Do you think Anthony Joshua at some stage has to dip his toes uh, across the Atlantic? Uh, that's all up to Anthony Joshua. He doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do because the money, the money is where Anthony Joshua is. If, if anybody wants to fight him, they've got to come to fight him in the UK. If that's, he calls the shots. He's the biggest earner around at the moment. You know, he's the boss. And it's all down to if Anthony Joshua wants to go fight in America, maybe one day go fight in Vegas or Madison Square Garden. That's a personal choice of his. But I believe he can fight wherever the hell he wants to fight and people just got to come and fight him. I'd agree, but if, if you look at the Klitschkos they fought in Germany for so long, particularly yeah. Vladimir, do you think his kind of legacy is not damaged, but he doesn't get the respect he deserves because he hasn't fought as much in America, especially in his, his prime? Yeah, well, you know, as I say, I, th I think he's quite confident in himself. I think he's quite happy in himself. I think he's, he's happy where he is, what he's achieved. And will there be a little kind of niggling down in the back of his mind, say, you know what, maybe i got to go fight in America, maybe i got to go away from my backyard. I mean, if you look at Roy Jones Jr., he spent most career in Pensacola, you know, and although people did say, you know, he never came out of Pensacola much, he's still, I still look back at him as probably one of the greatest, mm. you know, fighters of the last 50 years. So you will get your critics that will find something to pick yeah. at. 
But, uh, you know, it'll be a personal choice for Andy Joshua. It really will. And it will have to be one of the biggest fights in boxing history where it's, it's a challenge that he wants to go towards. But it's all down to who's paying the most money. And I think right now people got to come and fight him where he wants to fight them. And the plates have shifted a little bit where, as Simon said, UK fighters can keep their base in the UK, as can Irish fighters, really, if they want to live in the UK. But Steve obviously went to America, yes. trained under Freddie Roach, yes. like Goody Petronelli, like unbelievable yes. schooling. And that yes. obviously bore into you becoming a trainer. And you would Absolutely, have picked up yeah. stuff. Like It must be an invaluable yeah, well, resource now, is it? Well, my father died when I was young, so we were kind of raised by my, my mother, but my brothers, like they were kind of father figures to me. So Steve had been in America for a while, till he got sick of me, and then he sent me home, and then <laughs> my brother Roddy took me off to England for a while, till he got sick of me, but I, I, was, I, I was like a sponge, I used to go to the gym, and I used to train as a kid, as an amateur, but I used to watch all these, there was, there was always an event going on at that gym, because Hagler was there, and I'd be like sitting there watching Goody Petronelli, and you know, learning from these guys, and then when, fast forward so many years, I eventually gone myself, and started working with Goody, and uh, it, was, it was a great learning experience, and you know, I always say what I didn't get out of being a fighter myself, I, I'm getting out of being a trainer. And uh, I wish I had had a manager mm. like me and a trainer like me because I didn't. You know, when I was fighting, I used, I used to get a phone call, you're fighting two weeks, okay. Never even knew what weight I was fighting. I couldn't even tell you a tour of the guys I even fought. I didn't even know like I was getting paid. Mm. I just went out and fought and had no manager really. So what I've, what I've learned from great trainers and what I didn't have as a manager, I'm putting that into my fighters now. And, um, and, and we're doing good, we're doing really good. Like, it's, for such a small gym in Dublin, and we don't care, you know, boxing at the moment is, 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 is taking off again in Ireland, but for a while there was a lull, having to go to America, having to go to the UK. But it's, it's a pretty successful gym. I mean, we've, there was one time, probably four, three, four years ago, we had three, four, it was ranked top 10 in the world. So, I hopefully, it's, it's my education with Freddie Roach, I mean, Goody Petronelli and how we hooked up with Freddie Roach was funny because when Lennox Lewis fought in the three arena um, I actually boxed in the undercard and Freddie had Justin Fortune who right. was fighting Lennox Lewis that night and Freddie like wasn't a name at that time he had no world champions or anything and um, we knew Freddie from Boston myself and my brother Steve and we met him in the hotel and the Gresham chatting and it just happened my brother Steve was going through a court case with Matt Trump at the time and his trainer uh, Freddie King was tied in with Matt Trump, so we couldn't train with him no more so we just while he was there with Freddie, he says, would you come on board and work with me? And Freddie mm. goes, yeah, sure. He knew him, he trusted him. And then it just took off from there. Yeah, and you're obviously one of the leading trainers over in this part of the world now, but your first training experience, you were still kind of fighting at the time, weren't you, with Kevin McBride? Yeah, well, me and Kevin lived together in Boston. Kevin came out to me when he, he finished in the UK, and then we lived together for a while, and we were good friends. We boxed on a few amateur shows as well, but we were good friends. And um, You were the mastermind behind the Tyson win, weren't well, you? Well, I... <laughs> You know, I couldn't, I won't say I was the mastermind, but what happened was, I was getting ready for a fight in, in Foxwood, so was Kevin, but I got a bad cut and I had to pull out. But for that fight, I was getting Kevin ready, you know, getting his train ready, his fitness, and, um, and he went out and he, he, he uh, beat a good, good fighter in, um, in, in Foxwood. And then after that fight, he says, right, you're going to fight Mike Tyson. So he goes, cool. And he says to me, will you help me train for this fight? And I says, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm not doing anything anyway, you know. But, <laughs> it's only Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? But you see, from being around boxing at a young age and, and watching, and, I, and I've watched it, you know, fighters who are great at one time, and they've gone that little bit too long, and they're still great, but it just, it's not happening for them. Same with footballers, like you, you miss that ball or a run or... They still know what they and, want to do. Mike Tyson, at that time, he was 37, I think, and he was coming to the stage where um, he just got beat by Danny Williams. And But nobody gave Kevin a chance. And that, that was a challenge for me. And it was like, we were great friends. And people used to sit in the, the Green Hills Bakery. It was, I don't know if anyone's been to Boston, but it's a, yeah. it's a kind of a, a hope for Irish people all me have a coffee and a, you know, I won't say a donut or anything, but yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> so um, nobody gave him a chance. And I said to Kevin, you know what? I think he can beat Tyson, I really do, but you've got to give me everything. Give me 100% and, and I want nothing. I just don't even want to get paid. You just beat Mike Tyson, that would be enough for me. So we had to move into a hotel because we tried to do it from home and he just wasn't getting out of bed. I was going to knock the door and dragging him out, no. So we moved into a hotel and, you know, there was little, little things like, um, there was little things like with Kevin where, Kevin like is, 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 is in, 
Kevin is a, he's admitted that he has a problem with alcohol. And at that time, I never realised, you know, that he did have a problem with alcohol till we moved into a hotel and we got separate rooms. And I caught, I caught him sneaking out a couple of times, now I think he was going to go to the bars. So then we moved into the same room and I kept on the lock and key, but it was draining for me. And it was, but it was something I had to do for the eight weeks out there. And I just kept saying to Kevin, you know what, you can beat Tyson. Let's find a game plan. So we looked at videos of, uh, of, of Lennox Lewis because he's a big man like Kevin. Um, and most big guys that fought Tyson, I was saying, right, you know, the, the one thing you have of him is size and weight. So when he gets in close, tie him up and put your weight on him. Kind of lean into him, drain him, drain his legs. And if you watch back the fight, Kevin was taking a lot of shots. Kevin's tough, you know. Mm. He was in good shape. And uh, when he get close to Tyson, he just put his weight on him and kind of drain him over the rounds. And, and in the end, that's when Kevin stopped Tyson because Tyson was fatigued at that stage because he tried everything to get Kevin out of there. You know, he headbutted him. Kevin reckons he bit him on the nipple. I didn't say that, but Kevin said he did. He tried to break his arm, and he basically he uh, he wore him down. Kevin did, and it was it was brilliant. It was a great night. It was a great night for me because of all the naysayers who said you won't last five rounds, you won't last six rounds. I said, Kevin, you can beat this guy. Give me everything in training camp. And but after that training camp, I could never do that again. I was absolutely drained. It was like I was picking his food. I was getting him up to go for runs. You know, one day, funny story, we actually got lost the first one we done. A place called, everything we did was significant to the training camp. So DW Field is in Brockton. That's where Marshall used to do all his runs. So we used to do all the runs Marshall had done. But I didn't know the route too good, so we actually got lost. So the first day, I think we ran for like 11 miles or something, you know. And poor old Kevin's in bits. But uh, it, it was great times, and it was a great win for Kevin. And, he, you know, unfortunately, that's what he'd been remembered by, you know, beating Mike Tyson. I think Kevin could have went on to better things. But, you know, personal issues got in the way and it actually never happened. Mm. And you, man you're, you mentioned that you wish you had a good manager when you were fighting, but you would have negotiated with Don King around that time. What was that like? I was, that was kind of cool because if, if, if I get to meet you, I will judge. I won't even judge it, but I get to know you, f mm. you know, what I see in front of me. I don't listen to stories that goes on that this person does this because you always hear the bad things about people, not the good things. Yeah. So it was interesting, we went down to meet Don King uh, with Kevin and uh, a friend of ours who's also Kevin's lawyer, Mike Moynihan. He flew us down to Florida, um, Deerfield Beach. We arrived at his office and he never turned up. So we're sitting, waiting to have a conference, he never turned up, he got tied up with something else. Now I reckon, there was a little room there where we in the direction where we sitting behind looking at us through two-way glass, talking <laughs> to his son Carl and Dana James, who was the president at the time. And we're talking away, they're kind of picking our brains, and this is right, we're going to put you up in the Hilton Hotel next time. They really did it well in style to give us a tour of the, of the uh, setup, and next day we went back and we met with him. And, but I did ask him a question. I said, you know, before we go any further, I've heard so many stories um, about you ripping this guy off, that guy off. You know, what have you got to say about it? He goes, listen, you know, you hear the story about Tim Witherspoon, how Frank Bruno, he said, you know, we're trying to make the fight with Witherspoon and Bruno. Bruno got paid. Huge amount of money. He said, but how it started was, we spoke to Witherspoon. We said, how much do you want? They told us what they want. We made them a counter offer. He said, gone back and forth. Eventually, we all agreed. So we negotiated, we agreed. It was written in stone. Then we went back to Frank Bruno. He got paid like 900 grand. I think Witherspoon got 150 grand. And he said, basically what it was, they were better negotiators. They had more to bring to the table. He said, and we all agreed. Once we agreed, you walk away. So he said, before you leave here today, whatever you agree, you will get. Mm. He said, you won't get a cent more, a cent less. So, I'm sure there's other people has, you know, fallen out from him and, you know, maybe being screwed or they screwed him or I don't know. But he treated us really good. When we fought in the shows, he paid well. He was moving Kevin into a big fight against uh, Nikolai Valuev for the title. Um, and it was a fight Kevin had in Chicago and Kevin never turned up for the fight because, you know, there was things he was doing he shouldn't have been doing. But, uh, but Don King was always a good guy to work with. He was a clever guy, very clever guy. And he, he used to fly us... He would fly us to Boston, sorry, we lived in Boston, to New York, to Chicago, any shows he had in North America um, that he was putting on. He would fly me, Kevin, and two guests for free, first class flights and uh, hotels, just fly us to the box. And so <laughs> it was a great time. It was a great, great time to be around him. He was, he was an interesting guy. You, all that experience, though, you gain, and now you have it where. We, we saw it even at the weekend where Ryan Burnett was stopped and that duty of care that a trainer really? has. You've stopped fights plenty of times before. I, yeah. I, I, I think of Spike, Spike and Eubank, Eubank yeah. Jr. And yeah. You just know, I'm sure, by looking. Well, well how you know is, uh, I mean, 
you were with that guy for the last eight years prior to that fight, or seven years I was with Spike, and you know his abilities, you know what he can do. But you also see in the gym on a day where you're training where the guy's just not turning up in the gym. He's, he's, you know, I say, go home, take a day or two off, you know, something's not right, come back, let's start again. And you get to know these guys. And when he fought Eubank, um, after two, three rounds, Spike was landing really good shots. And Eubank was coming back, you know, he was taking, he was tough, he was taking and coming back. But his mouth was wide open. He was finding it hard to breathe because his nose was broken. He was swallowing a lot of blood. So I thought, you know, Spike keeps the pressure on him. He may even stop him later on in the fight. Round four, rounds four and five, Spike just forced he came back to the corner. And as I'm talking to him, he's like, he's looking through me. He's not there. Mm. So I thought, must be something wrong here. And then I was saying to him, I said, I said Spike, he's throwing uppercuts. And I said, he's landing them on you because you're leaning into the shots. So start leaning away from that uppercut when you throw when you throw a combination you finish start leaning away from the, upper, from the uppercut so he's not landing it but even when I was telling him to lean away he was still leaning back into the shot so I knew everything was in reverse to what I was telling him to do there was an underlying problem there so I thought I can leave Spike in there for 12 rounds he can take a beating and his career could be over it could be a career finishing fight or he might have a chance of landing I'm not going to go with that risk because I know he still has a long career ahead of him so I just decided I'm pulling them out. And I did. And I did say to Spike once twice in the corner prior to I said, Spike, if you don't give me a little bit more, if you're going to keep getting him, these shots going to pull you out. He was like, no, give me one more round, give me one more round. And then when I decided to stop the fight, he looked at me. But he, we've got a great connection. You know, he trusts me, I trust him. And that's how I knew on the night there was something up. Because he's, he's tough and, he, you know, he can sustain a lot of pain and come back from him. But I'm not going to leave him there to, you know, to suit the promoters or suit the fans because I got yeah. abused over it. But the funny thing was, after the abuse, the next fight Eubank had was against uh, Nick Blackwell. Mm. And Nick yeah. Blackwell ended up, you know, in a coma. Yeah. So, I think I made the right choice. I, I don't really worry what other people yeah. think about what me does, anyway. like, Say, in that instance, is it a case that after the fight, is Spike still saying to you, I thought you were a bit early to stop it? Or no, no. Did he, just walk out that day, that night and he go? He knows, he knows, away. he knows. I, I've been around the game for a long time and I... I'll always tell my fighters, listen, you go out there, you give me your all. But I'll protect you. Don't worry, just give me your all. I won't let you... You know, at the end of the day, Spike has, has kids at home. He's got a family at home. And, you know, in three, four years' time, boxing will be gone. Yeah. He's got the rest of his life to get on with. And, you know, I, when I boxed in America, it was a tough time then because it was really... There was a commission, but there was very little rules as far as brain scans. There was no brain scans. And, and I see guys now who I boxed with back then, and they can't even put a uh, sentence yeah. together. I don't want that for any of my fires. And do you, no. do you find it difficult to when, when you're coming to that point going, I might have to make a call here? Is that, does it weigh on you a bit more? <clears throat> um, not really, no. Well, I tell you, when Spike got dropped by... by um, Lemieux. 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 <laughs> I mean, that shot just came out of nowhere. Lemieux was kind of there, but it kind of came around and landed on Spike on the top. As soon as he hit the ground, because... The problem was, although Spike was getting up, he was a little staggered. I grabbed the towel. If the referee hadn't stopped, I would have stopped it. Because, and Spike did say, like, there was about 15 seconds he might have recovered. But the thing about David Lemieux was such a big, big puncher. That if he does get another one of them shots on, he, he could paralyse, he could, you know, people, he could end up in a coma or something. He could end up with a bad injury. So I thought to myself, wow, that was some shot. And he's not going to recover. Even if he makes it to the round, he's not going to recover from that shot. So I had to tell ready to throw, and I would have thrown it. And, <clears throat> and although HBO pays huge money for the fight, and I'm still there to protect my fighter. And if they never work with me again, and they say, you were too quick, I really don't care, because he's, he's my friend, and he's my boxer, and I'll always take care of my fighters, always. You yeah. know? It's great, like, Spike, obviously, um, has built his base in America, really, with Golden Boy and so, and so on. And it's coming on four years ago since that card in the three arena with Matthew Macklin headlining. Yes, Spike yes. had a great win against Anto Fitzgerald yes. and you had a couple other fighters in that card. Yes. And it felt like if Macklin had got the win there, it was kind of, we were on the cusp of a boom there and like uh, it could take off, but it just never really materialised. And obviously circumstances mean it, there's unlikely to be a, a boxing event in that arena anytime soon. So is that frustrating for you? No, not really, no. I've got like loads of air points. I wear Aer Lingus. <laughs> <laughs> I can use the lounges now, so I, I get all these trips to America. But you know, I get, I, I take everything for what it is. Mm. I don't say there's nothing happening in Ireland. You know, I'm, I'm I, I regret that there's no shows in Ireland. I, I do, but I look to what I have got in front of me, and I'm getting great opportunities to meet great people. Mm. You know, in, in, in Boston last weekend, I met up with all my old friends, and 
you know, when I say our friends, like, when I first got the train, like, it was, you were a nod to meet the big promoters and the ring announcers and all. Now it's just like meeting you guys here. It's just, yeah. you get to know them and you look forward to meeting them. Um, and as far as boxing in Ireland, boxing in Ireland never took off. You know, we had the times with Bernard Dome where, with, you know, people go to Tree Arena probably twice a year, three times a year. And it was great. They were a great night out. It was one or two fighters fighting them shows. But, you know, boxing doesn't really get the, the backing as it should in Ireland because we, it's, it's our best sport. You know, martial arts, boxing, it's our best sport. We don't get the backing and probably won't. Probably won't get it, you know. And, and, and I think because maybe the money's not there from the sponsors, the advertisement like rugby and Gaelic. People, you know, bitch about how come there's so much rugby on TV and soccer and Gaelic. The fact of the matter is there's companies willing to pay to put on. People don't get that. It's not like the, you know, RTE or any of these other companies hate boxing. They don't. If boxing sold and if people wanted to pay big money for the advertisements, they'd put it on. And if you got it on TV, what happened then is people on TV would see fighters who's fighting in Westport and they go, well, he's a good fighter. I'm actually going to go see him fight Percy next time. So because they're not on TV, people don't know them. And it'll probably never happen. Wish it would, but probably never will. And, like, you've obviously had Conor McGregor in your gym a good bit. And <coughs> there's an MMA community that wouldn't have been there maybe 10 years ago. Do you welcome that into Dublin, or are you, are you still kind Absolutely. of protective of boxing? Oh, no, no, no. It's, come here, I'm into all kinds of sports. I mean, we were watching the Irish, the women's hockey team, our last fight. We were all sitting down to watch the semi-finals of the Irish women's hockey team. And, and the final, because they're athletes and they're sports people, <coughs> they put the work in and... You know, I, I love to see, I love to, I'm a patriot, I'm a, I'm a patriotic man from Ireland. I love to see Irish people do well. And I'll invite people to my gym and, and it's mostly for nothing. I train a lot of guys for nothing. I don't take anything off them because I just love to see them achieve and be successful. And, you know, Connor first came to the gym with Stephen Orman years back and before he became a big name. And he was a nice lad, quiet lad, came in, <coughs> trained hard, done his work. But there was something about him even then, and there was something special about him even then, the way he carried himself, the way he, you know, he, he greeted me, shook my hand, and he was very uh, grateful to be there. And, and even when he left, he'd done the same thing. But from the time he walked in to the time he left, I didn't even notice him. He went off, he'd done his training. And then we got to know each other, and I used to do some pads, and got to like him, he'd spar with the lads. And then overnight, it became this huge success. But when he'd come back to the gym, and a lot of times come back and we'd make sure there's nobody there to annoy him or take pictures or anything, anything like that. And he was still the same person he was seven years ago. And then we actually, <coughs> we were at Connor in Boston last weekend, and uh, sure, I, haven't, I haven't spoke to Connor probably in, since the, the Mayweather fight. Actually, no, I did. I was, I was actually with him in his own gym. But we sat there and we had a crack and we chatted. And it's, just, it's still the same Connor that was there seven years ago. There was no cameras in his face, there was no entourage with him. It was me, Spike, Connor, and a few other lads, and we're having the crack on top of Stephen Orm, the Neen Teams, and all these fighters that came to the gym all them years back. So, as far as I'm concerned, he, he wants to come to my gym and train, he's welcome. Um, we've had other fighters from, from John Cabin's gym. I, I have a good relationship with John Cabin now, so we sent some fighters over, top fighters, um, to get some you know, boxing techniques and, and boxing skill and sparring. And I welcome that because it's, it's a great community. It's, it's, I love going to my gym because, you know, all these different people come along. We all have the same kind of goal, the same drive. is to be very successful at whatever it is we want to do. So, mm. yeah, I welcome them all. And he's a big believer in positive energy around sports. And I know you've studied a bit of psychology in the past. Mm. And is that something you tap into a lot in, um, when you're coaching fighters? Yeah, well, I've actually, I've just got my diploma in uh, high performance coaching in the last three weeks. I've just finished doing that because it's something I want to go into, you know, outside boxing because there's no money in boxing, so I've got to still have to earn money. But I want to I want to go into high performance coaching as far as in, in, in the corporate and business sector too, not just in the, in the boxing because it's all, you know, in sport, the gym is only one part of it. You've got to get your diets, you got to get your mindset, your sleep, your family life, your work life, your finances. Everything has to work. Mm. You know, everything has to work together. And I, and I, and I sit down with all my fires and, I, you know, I see little things change a little bit, maybe a little bit of stress as our guys are in the gym and they're not happy. And we sit down and we talk and we, we work out why they're not happy. And it, it's probably a case of where they're probably having to work more hours, they get into the gym less time. It's a rush. They're rushing in, they're rushing out. Um, they're not getting enough sleep and, and so we sit down 
and we work it all out. We say, right, how can we fix this? How can we fix that? Let's get that, you know, even key. Let's get that flow going right. And we do it with all the fires, and, and it works. It does work. It has to work. Yeah. Same with us sitting here today. If you're having problems at home or if you're a finance or if you've got a problem with your mortgage, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be enjoying your job because you have other things in your mind. So you've got to sort out all these other things first and then come to the gym. Training is easy. Fighting is easy. It's the other stuff that goes with it. It's the hard part. Mm. And in the gym, obviously, we have Ray and Spike, that big car, coming up next yes. month. And Niall Kennedy had a great win on that Boston Niall Kennedy had a real tough fight in Boston. He fought a mixed martial artist. Um, did you anticipate a bit of a judo toss or whatever your man did to him? You didn't I, I was actually shocked that the referee didn't even take a point. The referee was like, he warned him. But that was like, that was like totally breaking the rules. There wasn't even a point taken off. And I think, funny enough, I think that round, <coughs> I think one judge might have even gave it to the guy. So I just, I didn't figure it out. But what I do love about American uh, fights is that there's no bullshit. You're, there's two men in there to fight. You know, and if they get carried away, do something silly like that, the referee will warn you, say, right, get on with it now, don't do it again. Yeah. There's no big hullabaloo made about it. That's the one thing I love about the American judges and the American referees, they, they get involved. And it was a tough fight from Niall, but we have, you know, Niall prior to that had fought another small guy. And um, these small guys are very hard to deal with. And it it's probably doesn't suit his style. Yeah. But the fight was offered, we had to take it, and we did. He was undefeated, he was tough, he was rough. And Niall came through that, and there was times in the fight where Niall got emotionally involved, and that happened after he got thrown to the ground. Mm. And he, he was a little annoyed with himself, getting emotionally involved, but what I took out was, I said, you know, you won the fight, you overcame a, you know, a little bit of, you know, I don't know, messing about in there, but you showed, I said, what you did show was you showed that you've got that little bit of aggression, that if guys tried to, you know, bullshit you in there, you'll stand up to them. And I said, I like that. That's what I like. They tried to bully you. We go, well, I don't want to sort you out. And he did. He did. You know, and, and over time, we, le- we, we learned to keep that contained. And, you know, so I, I looked at it a bit scrappy at times, but there was a lot of uh, pluses we took out of that fight. And he had great support in the night as well. Um, what's, what's the plan for Niall? Like, what's, the, what's his real target? Uh, well, you know, the funny thing is, we were offered the fight, um, Joe Joyce, Paddy's Day last year, or this year, sorry, a short notice, but the money was huge. Like, the money, some guys wouldn't even fight for Europeans. I didn't get that kind of money. The money was huge, and we were like, no, it's not about the money. And I said to Niall, Niall goes, what's he? I says, it's not about money with you and me, no, it's about a journey. I said, if they offer 50,000 now or 60,000 now, in 12 months' time, you could get three or four times that if you keep moving along, moving along, because heavyweight division is where the money is. Mm. So Niall had this win again in, in Boston, and straight away we're getting offers to fight, and on the undercard of Wilder Fury, being brought in as the B-side fighter, being offered huge money. <clears throat> and we're like, nah, you know, money, money will come, that'll come in time, but let's finish the journey first, let's get to where we want to go first. So Ken is great, Ken, you know, asks me, what do you think we should do next? So it's, right, we get him out, <clears throat> probably Paddy's Day, in Boston, huge card headline, um, for a title, maybe an NABA, NABF, a top 15 ranking in the world. And then we build from that. And then, the following year, who knows? You know, you might get an offer to fight Andy Joshua. If you're a ranked fighter, they can they can make these fights happen. And then you say yes because you have an opportunity to win a world fo- title. And if it doesn't happen, if you don't win the fight, at least financially you've got something to sit back and go. You know, it was a little soon for this fight to happen, but I can go out and buy a house now and 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 you know, no mortgage free. So something good. That's what we're planning with Noel. We're taking our time. He's, he's only 34, 35 now. People say that's all. It's not. Look at all the champions that's around now. I mean, look at Bellew. Uh, I think he's 34, 35. 35, and, yeah. 35 and Pacquiao. And, you know, age is just, it's just a number in my eyes. Anyway, so we big plans for Niall. Good stuff. And um, you've obviously <coughs> you've trained all sorts of fighters over the years, but I read something where you trained Matthew McConaughey. Is that true? What happened was, my brother Steve had the upstairs part of the uh, Olympus gym in Cable Street. And we, when I'd come home from America, I would use it. I would use the upstairs part. It was a boxing ring and bags and the whole lot. And I came down one day, it was two skinheaded guys hitting the bags. And I got chanting them, they were American. So, I, at that time, I, you know, I didn't even watch movies. I knew nobody, absolutely knew nobody. And uh, I was chatting away, I said, yeah, we're over here making a movie, you know. I said, yeah, what's your name? Yeah, Matthew McConaughey. He was, oh, pleased to meet you, Matthew. And the other guy, what's your name? And I think it was Christian Bale as well. Like, and we're chatting away, you know. I didn't know who they were. And like, and Tommy, the guy on the gym, says, uh, this is, uh, they're making a film here. I said, really, what's the film? They were telling me. And 
what films you're making? I still didn't get it. So for weeks, we are just training there. And then there was a, a show on in um, Smithfield, I think it was the Boston Novice Social Club, or I think they were like a, a jazz band from Cuba, or maybe I got the name wrong. But anyway, uh, Matthew had the whole top floor of the uh, Chief O'Neill's Hotel booked. And he invited us to go down and the whole lot. It's only then that my wife realised that's Matthew McConaughey, the actor. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's funny. I, I just bought a house that time and it was two acres. And I was so proud of myself. Just came back from me. It's, I had a horse and I had two acres of land. And I remember I was chatting away. I said, yeah, I just signed for a new house. Two acres. And I goes, yeah, I got a ranch in Dallas or Texas. Where he says, like, 10,000 acres. Was, Jesus Christ. You know, I was so proud of my two, two acres. But uh, I didn't know who he was. And, and I'm glad... I'm glad I didn't because we actually just chatted and got on well and, you know, and he was a lovely guy and, and uh, funny enough, uh, Tommy used to bring him into the little pub around the corner with the gates at, at the markets there. It was like a little private pub and he used to go in there and play pool and all his mates would drink and the stuntmen and they had a great time. They used to train Tommy's gym all the time because it was rough and ready and, uh, and then when Tommy died years later, he actually came back and visited his funeral. Really? He did, yeah. So he's a good guy, he's a nice guy. Nice guy, you know, but... Uh, yeah, I've actually heard about him talking fondly about um, spending time in Dublin and, and with, with, with real Dublin people and not really? being... And no. it's funny now that you're here telling us the exact same story, yeah. He didn't... Uh, he didn't... At the time, they all had skinheads, him and his stunt doubles, and big beards. They were like a rock band. So they used to be over in um, the pub in, in, in Oliver John Goak. They used to drink the end Temple Bar. They used to drink the little pub. I think it's called the Ponderosa, just around the corner from Slattery's, just around the Slattery's. They used to go in there and drink there and... And the, uh, there was one time they went off on a holiday to Tenerife for a week, him and the lads, a few lads out of the gym, just all went on holiday together. So it was just like a gang of men just hanging out together. And, you know, I still, I, I look back now, I go, oh, there's a thing, and I have one or two pictures now, but, you know, they're just ordinary blokes who's good at acting, that's it. And he makes big money from it, but he, he was a sound lad, and, you know, he was a good guy. He was a good guy. Just, uh, I, I know we were, obviously the big fight this weekend is Bellew and Usnick. Is there any other fights between now and the end of the year that you're really looking forward to? I'm looking forward to uh, Tyson Fury and Wilder. Mm. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I like big fights. I used to love, you know, the Hagler Hands fights and all these big, the best of the best fighting each other. And, you know, you've got to take your hat off to Tyson Fury. I was actually in Germany when he beat Klitschko. Yeah. We were actually on the same floor, same dressing room. We were all hanging around together. And I was so happy for him when he beat uh, Klitschko because he went to Germany and it was very hostile yeah. atmosphere there and everything was done against him. I mean, there was talk over the ring covers and when we got there first, there was three mats and there were probably about 30 mil ticks. So it was probably 90 mil of mat and it was like being on a mattress. So they made him take one out but they still did everything against him winning but he went out and he schooled uh, Klitschko on the night. Um, I like Wilder too. Yeah. I like Wilder too. He's, he's, he's raw. You know, but it comes to fight, it's exciting. And we need that excitement in boxing because, excuse me, heavyweight boxing and the heavyweight division for a while became boring. You know, the, the likes of Klitschko's, they were very good at what they did, you know, stand-up tall job, but uh, they were boring to watch. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't cross the street, you know, you missed the Mike Tyson. So I think Fury and Wilder right now are two, you know, it's an exciting fight. It's an exciting fight and... Uh, it was the pick. I, I couldn't pick this one. Um, I think Wilder is very dangerous. You know, if he lands, he'll knock out. He'll knock yeah. out any heavyweight if he lands. But Tyson Fury is a very clever fighter. You, you know, you watch him fight Klitschko. He's got a certain game plan. Then I went over and seen him fight Dave Gisora. He boxed Southpaw for the whole night. So he's, he's, you know, he comes up with all these different game plans. However, his, his uncle's not there yeah. this time. And he, I don't know who comes up with all these game plans. Was it Tyson, his uncle? You know, had they got that good connection? So it'd be interesting to see with his new trainer, can they still mimic the old way of changing? You know, in a fight, if you're if, if one plan's not working, can you change? And Tyson Fury can. He's he's got great boxing ability. He's got great belief in himself. And uh, I think for him mentally, I think it'd be good to get the win for Tyson. Yeah. And I hope he does. I like him. I've met him a number of times, and he's a real nice guy. Yeah, should be a good one. Yes. Right, well, time to move on to this weekend's action and what a fighting prospect as Britain gets set to host its first ever four-belt undisputed world championship fight as Tony Bellew challenges Alexander Usyk for all of the marbles at uh, Manchester Arena. Glenn McCrory knows a thing or two about the Cruiserweight Championship and I'm delighted to say he joined us earlier to preview Saturday's action. OK, so I'm delighted to say we're joined on the line by former Cruiserweight Champion of the World, Glenn McCrory. Glenn, how are things? Everything's very good, thank you. Great to be on the show. 
Uh, thanks a million for taking the call, Glenn. Um, I think everyone's looking forward to seeing how Saturday plays out. A lot has obviously been made out of um, U6 amateur credentials, but you have um, you have experience with one of the greatest amateurs of all time in Chaffalo Stevenson. Like, where would you say U6 is in terms of his amateur credentials moving into the pro game? Well, you've got to respect anybody that's done what he's done, the amount of fights he has as an amateur, being an Olympic an Olympic champion, his credentials are, are there. And obviously, you know, it's a tough it's a tough road coming through the amateurs or coming through the pros from the Ukraine. It uh, you know, you have to be you have to be very, very good as as we've seen with um Vassel Lomachenko. You know, these are superbly talented fighters and you know, it's tough coming from, from you know, East Europe to to make a, a name for yourself in the West and become as become as 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 prominent as you are and get in, in big fights. So obviously, you know, his talent speaks for itself. Yeah, and uh, just on the Stevenson point in Cuba, like you mentioned, Ukraine have sort of built sort of a reputation as a hotbed for boxing. Is that a common thing to have a culture of boxing in a country? Like, I know you spent a lot of time in Cuba. Was I spent an awful lot of time in Cuba. I did a, did a lot with them. Was was great friends with Teofilo, and and it 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 becomes it's a way of life for the youngsters. Mm. It's a way of life. It's almost you know they just automatically go into into boxing, and I think that's that's one of the sports in the Ukraine that is is very high. Certainly for the you know the 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 children with from you know. Families with less less money to put them into football or different sports, they'll um, they'll progress into boxing. In Cuba, it is it is just a, it's almost a way of life. It's I know it's not the national uh, sport as, as baseball is, but but the opportunities aren't there in baseball where the opportunities for the youngsters in Cuba are there. They can travel the world. They can get outside Cuba by by doing this sport and. And that's why there's, there's, you know, such success in countries like that. Mm. And like for Cuban amateur boxers, it was always difficult to make the switch to pro game without defecting, as it were. But um, it was kind of a similar situation with the Eastern Bloc fighters. But now Ukrainians, as you mentioned, have got the chance to make their mark in the pros. And Lamachenko has done it and now Yusik is doing it. Um, how impressed have you been with Yusik? Like, do you think he's adapted well to the pro game or is he still sort of ironing out the kinks from the amateurs? Well, I, I think we've got to go back a little bit because the the, the, the two guys that, that probably opened up the Eastern Europe to the professionals, and it probably took that, were the heavyweights and were the Klitschko mm. brothers. So they opened up, you know, they opened up the, the world of boxing to, from east to west. And um, and obviously Lomachenko and, and Yusek have followed on in that tradition, that, that great tradition that they, they have left. Um it is. It's still. It's still difficult. It's still difficult. It's still difficult for commentators to pronounce their name. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always. So it's always got to be. It's always got to be a. You know. Obviously, it's 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 a different. It's a different um, culture. So, um, but they've adapted, and uh, you know, the world's become a, a much smaller space in in sport, isn't it? We see that in football. You know, it's becoming. You know, it's 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 a world. It's almost a world league in boxing. Is becoming the same now because TV and media can bring these faces, bring these names, bring these great talents into our front rooms. Yeah, and just on Usyk, like he's obviously the undisputed champion at the moment, and was like peerless in the World Boxing Super Series. Like his performance in the final was immaculate, but like Maris Bredis did give him a bit of trouble in the semi final. Are there any holes in his game that you think Tony Bellew might be able to exploit? Do you know what? He's he's a He's an excellent mover. You know, if somebody was saying to me as a cruiserweight, you know, would 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 you say fear the put the fear of God in you? No, he wouldn't. And I think um, Tony Bellew has got, um, uh, you know, he's got a marvelous opportunity. Usyk is a tremendous talent. Uses footwork. He's got a great engine. Throws lots of punches. But he's no Evander Holyfield. Mm. You know, so so we're looking at. And a fighter that is very, very good, very technical, you know, moved on from the amateurs excellently, you know, but he can, he can, he can be beat. And, you know, his power, 
His punch power is not what Tony Bellews is. Um, so I think Bellew, you know, needs to needs to land big punches. He needs to go in there. He, he's in a great he's in a great position, Tony, because it's kind of a it's a fantastic opportunity that he's been given mm. um, on the back of the David Hay fights to to fight for four world titles. So he's just got to go out there. He, he, we know he's coming to the end of his career. He's 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 talked about retirement, intimate retirement. The, probably the chances they might not fight after this fight, but he said that before. But um, I think he's got to go in and and let the, let the big shots go. You know, he's, he's called the bomber. He, that's what he's got to look to rely on. But also, you know, against um, the Ford heavyweight uh, Michael Hunter. You know, who worked well, who took him the distance, who said worked well behind his jab. And I think, you know, a good jab, you know, meet fire with fire, meet jabs with jabs, meet meet boxing skills with boxing skills. And that. and I think um, there's certainly, uh, you know, uh, if I was Tony Bellio, I, 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 I wouldn't be unnerved by Usyk at whatsoever. Glenn, Phil here, just a lot of people expect Usyk to not dominate the fight, but certainly be the technical boxer. And, you know, you've referenced that he doesn't have that, you know, one-punch knockout power. So if you're in Tony Bellew's corner, and, you know, there could be a few rounds where he loses on the cards and you think, do you know what, just stay with him. He's going to make a mistake. You have mm. you have the punch power. That even if you yeah. lose 11 rounds out of 12, that one round, that one chance, it could, yeah, it could be there. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a long, it's a long night. A twelve-round fight is a long time. So he has to, he has, you know. I mean, he can't get hit too much. You know, his defense has to be good. He's got to so work his jab. He's got to work his jab very well. But then he's always got to be looking for one of the one of the punches to to ruffle Usyk and put him out of his stride. And then then he's got to pounce. And he's got to be ready. He's got to be ready. You know, to really. To really go to town, it's one of those where if you sit back, you're going to get outboxed every day of the week. But if you take it to another level, if you give him something that he hasn't seen before, then he can pull off. He can pull off uh, an unbelievable win. Yeah, it will be an incredible win for Bellew. But do we know how good Bellew is going to be for this fight? Because obviously he's coming back down to cruiserweight, and people would could argue that he fought. A David Hay that wasn't the David Hay of his prime. Oh well, I don't think I don't think that would even need to be an argument. If I'm honest, mm. I think um, I think David Hay was not at anywhere near his prime. It was a, it was um, probably a shadow of David Hay. But I think Tony Bellew, you know, did the job and did the job twice. Um, he, he, you still had to go out there and beat David Hay. You know, you still had to go out there and, and put it on him. You still had to go and, and meet 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 him in the ring. You still had to go and trade punches with a big puncher like Hay. And he did that. And he come through that. So you can't. I couldn't take anything away. You know, you can you fight and you beat the person that's in front of you, and that's that's what he did, and he did so well. That will have also, and I know it has, given him a tremendous amount of confidence. You know, he's, he's mixed it. He stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with a big puncher like Hay. And, you know, the last thing you lose is your punch. So Hay may have been a shadow boxing skills-wise of himself, but he still had his punch, and he still got that danger. And yet he took what he had to take. He came through that and, and beat Hay handily on two occasions. So that that's given him an awful lot of confidence. His confidence is king in the boxing ring. You need that. That's that's what you thrive on. And with a big crowd behind them, you're looking for Tony Bellew to be lifted. But you know, uh, Usyk is 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 a you know he's a cold, calculated character that's been through an awful lot, and he hasn't got four belts for nothing. So I'm expecting I'm expecting a great I'm expecting an excellent fight, an excellent spectacle. And um, a lot of drama. Do you think the weight will be an issue for Bellew? I don't. I don't. I mean, he was light, light heavyweight for, for most of his career at um, you know, 12 and a half stone. So, so he's... Um, so, no. So, I think the 14-4 really is... You know, he was cruiserweight champion. Um, that's where he had his biggest success at the cruiserweight division. So, I think, you know... He, he took a calculated gamble with David Hay because David Hay 
was really a blown up, you know, a big cruiserweight. So he took a cut of the gamble that paid off. He's now in the division that he's he's best at. That's his best division. He's never going to compete with the Joshuas and the Wilders and the Furies in, in reality. So he's in his be- he's in his, his his best weight. So this is where he's got the best chance. This is where he had his biggest success. This is where he's got the best chance of pulling off an astonishing win. Yeah, and then you mentioned uh, Tony as home advantage in this fight. The Manchester Arena will be be packed out. You obviously won the world title in on home territory as well. Is that a real thing you can tap into on the night of a fight? Is the home advantage a big, a big factor? Massively, absolutely, absolutely massive. If, if you use it for the right way, because you know an advantage can become a disadvantage if it gets to you. And obviously, if 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 suddenly you know the the pressure. Uh, gets to him and breaks him, or he starts to believe what you know most people think that that you know Usyk's a much superior fighter. Then, it, then it's gonna you know then he, he can make a break. And what you've got to do is take that energy, take that will. That, you know the people want you to win. The people are cheering for you. You've got to be inspired by that. You've got to use that like a fuel. And you know I think Tony Tony gets the crowd on his side. Tony, you know, he, 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 he almost goes with the drama of a, of a fight and he, he, brings, he, brings, he brings strength from that. So I think that's going to be a, a major factor. And Usyk will know that, though. You know, he's a very smart kid. He'll know that. And I, I know, fine, well, if you go to somebody's backyard, the first thing you've got to do is try and hurt them early. You've got to make a statement early. And that's what I think Usyk will be trying to do. Usyk will... And that's what that's why it has the makings of such such a good fight because I think the ingredients are all there to have the drama. Usyk will know he's got to go and silence the crowd right from the opening bell. So expect expect this to be a very fast a very fast start. I don't think they'll be feeling out in this fight. Yeah, and you mentioned Usyk would be trying to make a statement earlier, but he'd also be trying to make a statement on the night because. You know, he has talked about going up to, to heavyweight. There's that great photo of him lurking in the background when Joshua <laughs> beat Povetkin. I, it, I don't know who took the photograph. It was just incredible. <laughs> but it's his chance. It's his chance, though, to show the, the UK anyway. Um, you know, I'm going to take out uh, Tony Bellew and then I'm coming for someone like Anthony Joshua next. Well, I think you think like every fighter are looking to make their place in history, and Usyk will be looking at Joshua thinking, "Do you know what? Uh, he's he, he's not quite the real deal yet. Um, you know, his boxing ability, his movement, you know, his balance is 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 maybe not not a hundred percent quite there." He'd be looking at the little faults, the little chinks, and just saying. You know what? What this is my you know because he'll see you know obviously every fighter wants to make as much money and be as be as as, as big and as famous as they possibly be. So he'll be looking at that, knowing that you know the thing is knowing that he's got that great boxing that skill set to get him out of trouble. Um, that's 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 something you know that if you've got that in your locker, a lot of fighters you know they 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 put it out there and then all of a sudden they get hurt and they they haven't got a a great defense mechanism. Uh, he has. He's got that in his locker. So I think he'll be able to, he'll certainly be able to go in there and, and, and make a statement at heavyweight. But again, I, I think he's, he's, he's a cruiserweight. You know, he's a cruiserweight. Obviously, Holyfield is, is you know, the cruiserweight, the, you know, the last great cruiserweight that went up and, and, and dominated, you know, well, not quite dominated, but certainly held his head up with a, the top men in the heavyweight division, and and was a you know is a great is a great Holyfield, and I don't think Usyk is a Holyfield, but he's very very good. Mm, and Tony is a huge underdog in this fight, and you were quite a bit of an underdog when you won the world title against Lumumba. Is that does it, in a weird way does that take the pressure away, Glenn, when you um, no one's expecting you to win outside your own camp or whatever? You know, it was it was a shock to me. I didn't. I thought <laughs> I thought I had a chance in that fight till I read till I read the previews and they, you know the headline in the Sun was Glenn's a goner. Mm. So I thought I had a chance, but it was it was it was 
I, you know, I always thought I always thought I could win that fight, but I think the fact that when I realized that I hadn't, you know, people thought I had no chance. That that gave me that gave me a lot. That gave me a lot more force. That gave me a lot more determination mm. because I thought, you know, what? I mean, I remember for me, I remember looking at Lamomba and thinking, what's he prepared to give? on this night, what's he, and I thought to myself, and it was the only time I've asked myself this question, I said, I'm prepared to die. I am prepared. You know, and I, it was just me against myself. I'm prepared. I, I will, I will give that much. And at that moment, I realized that he wasn't prepared to die for this. It was a fight to him. He was coming to the Northeast to win the world title. And I thought, I've got him. So I got strength. I got strength from from being the underdog. I got strength because I asked myself, you know, what did it mean to me? What does it mean to Tony Bellew? You know, is he going to ask himself that? Does it mean the world to him? I think Tony Bellew has probably overachieved in his mm. career. He's done great, great things. Will he have that, will he have that same fervor to, to, to win this one? Or will, in his mind... You know, the pro one of the problems for me is, is you know, they talked about retirement in his last fight, and often when that happens, you're already kind of in your head retired, and and this could be his 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 nice little nest egg to you know to for the rest of his career, which is fair enough, he's earned it. But it really is about asking yourself how deep are you willing to go. I know Tony Bellew is a fighter, you know, he's a fighting man, so I think when that. When when Usha comes and snarls in his face, I think he'll 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 stand up and and go for him. Mm. And yeah, as you said, win or lose this weekend, it seems this is going to be Tony's last fight, and he has that experience in the Creed movie. And I know you have some acting experience yourself, Glenn. How are you finding that at, that play with your brother seemed to get remarkable reviews? Yeah, well, um, well I did a play in the West End um, called The Birds a couple of years ago. I haven't really. I mean, I. I it was something that I did. I auditioned for Bond when Pierce Brosnan, when Pierce Brosnan got it. I think I think I was what persuaded the producers that Pierce Brosnan was right for the part. Um, I love doing my, my I love doing um, bits of acting. Being lead in the West End was 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 great. Um, hopefully, there's some other stuff in the pipeline. It's just something I'm not going looking for. But um, yeah, Tony. I mean, he was very again. You know, he's, he's, been, he's been masterfully lucky in his career because of an acting role. He got to play a cocky cockney boxer. So, um, <laughs> so okay. he, he got some great luck there. But um, he's a great personality. You know, obviously he's got a he's got a career ahead of him um, on TV. You know, as I did. You know, for for twenty seven years and still do now on on radio. So he's. Um, you know, I think what he's got to do is is go out there. It's if it's one last fight, he's got to go out there and give it the uh, you know to have the best fight he possibly can. You know, go out there, and at the end of the day, his career, you know, people are going to talk about um, as, as an excellent career. He's got to go out there and finish it off. You know, he's still got a, he's still got a tough, tough job on his hands, and he's got to take care of business. Yeah, and Phil mentioned earlier the whole Usyk possibly trying to infiltrate the heavyweight division, and we've got a big fight coming up at the start of December with Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. How do you see that one playing out, Len? Well, you know, I've I, I, I followed Tyson for the last um, fourteen months or of, of, of his of, of you know this very quick comeback. It has been it has been um, very dramatic. The thing I've been really uh, uh, I've been really um, what's the word happy about in a way happy about them. Um, a remarkable comeback it really has because you know to see where he went to see how it affected him you know being stripped of the title um, how it affected him the British public's kind of total dislike of anything he said or done um, which I thought was horrendously unfair um, he's come back remarkable um, it's been a, an amazing comeback so I think a man that's got that sort of that sort of inner strength can pretty much do anything. Mm. Um, it's a tough, tough fight against Deontay Wilder, but he's a big, tough man. Um, obviously, inactivity is going to play its part. And 
you know, you wonder how much really deep inside he wants it. Whenever I've sat personally with him, he's always said, Glenn, I'm, I'll do anything for this and I'm going to get this back. And I think he really means that. So I think he's got an excellent chance. A lot of people think it's quick, but I think Tyson needs to get back in there and test himself as quick as he can. And I think he can pull off a amazing victory. I think he can shock shock the boxing world with a victory over Deontay Wilder. Mm. And you're obviously the main man in Northeast Boxing, Glenn, the first world champion from that region. And uh, Northeast Boxing seems to be in a good place with Josh Kelly and even Lewis Ritson, despite his loss recently. Are you happy with the way Northeast Boxing's going at the moment? I, I am happy. I am. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to see. I, I obviously, I was disappointed to see um, Lewis Ritson get defeated. I mean, I, I saw Lewis last night at a firework display with the with the kids. Um, he's a lovely guy. Um, you know, real northeast kid. Um, uh, he can come again. I think you know there's changes he na- needs to make. Um, but hopefully, he sees that you know a loss in boxing. It uh, does not mean that I, I was through a period of five or six fights, and it was, you know it was because you know I was being I was being badly managed and put in with the wrong fights, and yeah. obviously if that happens, you're going to get losses. So you know he needs to see what you know what he did wrong, what he needs to improve. But the good thing is in Northeast boxing, things are starting to to take off, and it's been a long it's been a long time probably since myself, John Davison, um, Billy Hardy that anything's really happened in the Northeast. You know, we are in a city which has three sports, and that's football, football, and football. And, you know, hopefully people now are starting to see with the resurgence nationally and, and worldwide of boxing, with this massive resurgence um, in the sport, or not resurgence, with this massive growth in the sport, it's just become a, you know, a, you know, a, a super sport, hasn't it? It's just grown... Mm. Um, into a, uh, you know, everybody, everybody wants to be at the big fight, so it's, so it's great. I think hopefully that will, that will push, that will push it on. Obviously, we've got a great amateur talent. The problem we have a little bit is out of sight, out of mind up here in the Northeast, but Josh Kelly's, uh, a, you know, a super talent and he's going to go on and do great things. And I'm sure Lewis is going to pull himself back and, and get back in the mix. And there's other good youngsters, uh, coming through the McCormack brothers. I'm sure we'll we'll go for the for the Olympics, um, and then look to and then look to unleash themselves on the professional world. So um, so I want to I also want to be be part of that. I'm actually kind of a young boy. He's, he's from London, called Lewis Isaacs, who's three and old, and we're training in in uh, the uh, gym in, in Newcastle, uh, or two's gym in Newcastle. So I'm setting up a base there, and I'm I'm for the first time looking. Just starting to look to be to get my myself um, fully into into training fighters and probably managing a few fighters and getting involved in that side. It was always going to be later in my career when I when I made that switch. But that's something I'm giving you a, a <laughs> I'm giving you a first here. <laughs> but um, that is something where I am looking now to to start pushing towards my own career in the, the training and managing the fighters. Excellent. Well, best of luck with it, Glenn. And do you know what? Before we let you go, we actually had never asked the, the toughest question is the verdict. Bellew and Usyk on Saturday. How do you see it going? I see Usyk. Usyk to win. Um, Usyk to win by point or late stoppage. Great stuff, Dan. Uh, thanks a million for taking the call. We'll uh, hopefully chat again soon. My pleasure. Um, please, please, um, Bring me one ever. Great God stuff, Glenn. Cheers. Glenn. All the best. All right, Glenn McCory there, former Cruiserweight champion of the world, previewing Saturday's big night in Manchester. We've been looking forward to this fight for a long time now, lads. Uh, what, what do we think? Uh, Usyk. I, I think he's just... He's going to be too good for, for Bellew. But Bellew obviously has power. Like, so he's always got a chance. But um, from what I've seen of Usyk, I just think he'd be, he'd be too good for him, be too mm. quick for him. But I, I do commend Bellew for taking on the fight. Yeah. Slime, what do you reckon? Yeah, I'd have to agree with Phil. Um, Usyk has taken a different route to, to Lamachenko. He was part of that uh, 2012 Ukrainian dream team. Mm. And like, whereas Lamachenko was signed up by top rank and he got the exposure pretty quickly with Bob Arum, um, Usyk kind of worked his way through the, the World Series of Boxing. 
And the, if you want to look at one fight, I think that kind of symbolises how this fight might go is his scrap with Joe Joyce in the WSB, where he completely outclassed him for four rounds, uh, in and out, in and out, and then the fifty stood and banged with him as well, and he just took him apart. I think it was fifty forty five, and mm. all three of the cards. Um, you know, he's won three three of his last four fights have all been against undefeated fighters. He's handed them their first losses. He's gone abroad to Moscow, Latvia, Germany, USA and Poland and now he's going to the UK. He's not scared to, to go into fighters back here clearly and, and uh, school them. And then if you look at Bellew, he has struggled. He was knocked down by... Stevenson. Makubu and Stevenson. then he was out, completely outclassed by Stevenson. Um, a light heavyweight. A light heavyweight, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, he was down by a straight left and then he was finished another left. So what's 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 also going to hit him with mm. all night long? So I'd have to go with um, with Glenn McCrory, their late stoppage mm. for Usyk. And Packy, like as we said, Glenn Bell is a big mm. underdog in this fight. If you were in his corner, what kind of tactics would you employ? Maybe. Well, I mean, Usyk comes from a great uh, story of boxers, Ukraine. I mean, he got so many great fighters, and he's around the same time of the Lemonchenkos, and people compare him to a Lemonchenko or Cruiserweight, and he has that good foot movement, and he's got good hand speed and his accuracy is like you know second to none mm. um, the difference between him and Lemonchenko is he does get hit sometimes Usyk and Tony Bellew has got power he's carried it up to Cruiserweight and if you look at his I think his last 10 fights for heavyweight Cruiserweight he's stopped 8 of them um, his two losses were at light, heavy, or light heavyweight for the titles he's, he reversed his draw he reversed one of his losses so really Steves is the guy that beat him um, you know Tony Bellew is not technically as good as Usyk he's not but what he could do is, and, and the way to beat these guys is, you jump on them, you just take the fight right to them, you don't keep it, uh, you know, two quarters, just get right on them, pressure them, pressure, pressure. Like my brother Steve used to do, jump on a fighter, make them fight hard, and it'll come down to who wants it more. If you, if you give him too much room, he'll take you apart, Usyk, because he's, he's, he's technically good. Stevenson did stop Tony Bellew, and he was a southpaw also. And it's funny, because I, I wrote that down too, but the straight left hand kept landing on Tony, but that was way back... And you can learn from them fights and you can go back to a gym and say, you know, I got hit too many times but that left hand. and So, you know, re- really Usyk should win. Mm. He should win. Tony Bellew's tough. He's a warrior. He, he probably sees this as his last fight one way or the other unless he wins. You know, it was the same when he fought David Hay. I backed him twice actually to beat David Hay. Um, and it's going to be an interesting fight. Um, the money will be on Usyk. Mm. But I think Tony Bellew's in there with a chance. He throws a really good left hook. He's got a lot of power. And he's got to smother that left hand. You know, and it's, it's easy to do with a southpaw. It's, you know, you get tight on them. Keep your right hand up tight. Wait for that left hand to come. Smother it. Get in close and let your left hooks go. And, and then tie him up and drain him, physically drain him. You know, that's, that's how I see Tony Bellew can win the fight. And he's got the, he's got the size, he's got the strength to do this. However... You know, you gotta go. It's like he's the, he's the technically like he's he's unbelievable. You know, yeah. he was the Olympic he was Olympic medalist. Yeah. His amateur pedigree. He was a world champion. He was European champion. He won all these belts as an amateur. So he's he's got the pedigree there. And like Phil, do you think everyone's saying Bellew has a puncher's chance? But do you think his boxing skills are underrated, or do you think he just has to go in there and swing for the fences? I'm not swinging for the fences, but certainly. He, he, one thing you know is he's not going to stand back and admire Usyk because that would just be playing into Usyk's hands. But no, he, he, he's a better boxer, I think, than people give him credit for. Um, I think a lot of people maybe, we don't know what to expect from him because David Hay was, as we talked about with Glenn, like David Hay was over the hill. Mm. Um, you know, he was still a dangerous opponent. Um, and I think maybe in the first fight, people maybe gave expected Hay to be closer to his peak than he was and obviously got the injury but Bellew beat him twice fair and square um, no I think he's a better boxer than, than people give him credit for and you know they'll have a plan and his will to win like, there's a lot to be said for that you know he is he's a bit of a freak himself he would say like about himself where he will do what it takes to win. I wonder, because he's almost retired in his head, I wonder, is that going to have a, an effect mm. on what actually happens on Saturday night? Where this is the last shot, but 
you know, if you don't go out in a blaze of glory, who cares? Like you've you've made your name. Yeah, and on the on the card of that fight, we have um, Dave Allen's back again. We have uh, Scotty Carl, Ricky Burns, and all Scottish clash, and Anthony Crowell, who's been spying, sparring with Ray. Yes, that's good experience for Ray, isn't it? To be in there with yeah, a former world champ. It, it's great experience from um, initially. It was just set up with one spar, and then Joe Gallagher got me back, got back to me, and said, "You know, let's get him back out. Mm. He's perfect." And um, yeah, you know, you, you learn from the older experienced fighters. You learn little tricks of the trade, and uh, you know, and, and Ray has told me this he said like and, and yeah also it also allows the fighter to realise where he's at at his stage was career too and um, and he's not you know Ray was a great amateur world, world amateur champion youth amateur champion and uh, he's, he's, he's a very clever guy and you know he, he's tried different things in the gym every day I explain try different things with Crawler and some things work some things don't work I mean you can do that with a former world champion it gives you confidence mm. so that huge card is coming up next month and we're all looking forward to that Unfortunately, last weekend, Ryan Burnett had a bit of a misfortune in his fight against Nanito Denair. Like It was a really interesting fight while it lasted, and it was just a pity how it turned out, wasn't it? Yeah, he started off really well, and obviously we had seen Denair fight in Frampton, and this was the night that we were... We, we obviously know how good Burnett is, and I thought in the second round he was very good. He was able to fight on the front foot. He was then able to roll back onto the ropes and duck, duck punches and land. He landed some really good right hands in that second round, and then he tried on the ropes in the third round, but he actually got caught a bit more. But it's just the injury; it's a setback. You know, he's been on, he's been on this, he's been on off the ball before, talking about like his road to get here. So, you know, it's just it's another hurdle. But I think he'll, he'll bounce back from it. It's just very unfortunate. But it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about uh, Adam Booth had to step in. Mm. And. I was saying off air to Packy that Ryan re- relies so much on his hips to sort of switch hit and that kind of thing. So um, it's the worst possible injury you could have got, probably. Um, and on that card as well, the main event in Glasgow was Josh Taylor. And for a long time, I was sort of telling people when they asked me who's the best prospect in boxing, I'd be like Josh Taylor. But he's gone past prospect stage now. He was he was really impressed with the weekend and serious operator, isn't he? Yeah. Well, I didn't know much about him. I, I actually knew his old amateur coach Terry McCormick. Um, from Lock End in Glasgow, and he's a really good coach, and he, he had a lot of su- uh, success in the uh, Commonwealth Games and amateur. He's a very good amateur, very good amateur. But you know, I didn't know much about him um, until he fought uh, the kid from London. He stopped. What was his name? Howard the Melty guy. O'Hara, O'Hara Davis. Davis. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people just wanted to see O'Hara Davis get beat that night. But you know, fifty like fifty percent of people thought O'Hara Davis would win because he's a puncher and he's come forward for it. But he got schooled. He got beat up. Um, and you know, but the pistol fight was the fight that excited me. Mm-hmm. Which I thought, because pistol has only been beaten once before by Terence Crawford, <laughs> the best pound for pound fight in the world. And I thought, this is a risk fight here. You know, you know, pistol's Ukraine, great fighter. This is a risk fight for Josh Taylor, but fair play for his team for taking it. They obviously believe in his ability, and he won that fight too. And I thought, wow, he, he, he's a special. He's special. He's a cell part too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, that does make a little bit of a Brilliant. difference. His, his body shots. Like the, there's real spite yeah. behind them. And yeah. Ryan Martin just didn't know what Are to do. Impressed? No, and like I actually I did think it was a poor stoppage. I thought the the it was he definitely hit him behind the head, but Ryan Martin was looking for a way out. Just even on the his corner, Abel Sanchez is in the corner. He didn't seem to give him much direct he was kinda of going for the motivational. Yes. Yes. You know. Yeah, he was trying to motivate him like what Angelo Dundee used to do. Mm. You know, let's get up, let's get out there. But there was no, there was no tactics like yeah. how do you avoid getting hit with these shots? And it's very hard with someone like uh, you know Taylor, like because he's so many different uh, mm. punches. He's, he, and, and he's got power. Yeah. I mean, he's top twelve was fourteen opponents at a very high level. So he's he's one to watch. And, and the thing about Scotland. Scotland's always thrown out every couple of years an exciting fighter. You know, they've got a great pedigree of amateurs and then all of a sudden they, they, it follows through to the uh, pro game and, you know, he, he seems like a real nice guy. I don't know him. Spike's met him a few times. He's a real nice guy and he's one to watch. He's exciting. Yeah, certainly one I want to see in the flesh fight. Mm. And it, he's retired now but it feels like every week we always bring up Floyd Mayweather and he's back in the headlines again. Simon, what's, what's uh, going on with him now? Yeah, he's... Uh, Signed up the fight at Risen yeah. against uh, in an unspecified uh, weight category, at unspecified rules against uh, Na- Nasser Kama, twenty-seven and zero kickboxer. Is this legit? Well, it's, it's what's been announced. Uh, yeah, 
27 now is a kickboxer, 4 now is an MMA fighter. Okay. But they haven't specified the rules yet. They're expecting a limited rule set, which I'd imagine is going to be boxing, with, with <laughs> MMA gloves, perhaps. That's about as far as they're going to stretch it. That's all I have, really. Good stuff. Well, uh, I think that's all, about, or, that's all we've got time for, more or less. Thanks again for coming in, Packy. Yeah, thanks for having me here. and I'm sure I'll be back here again someday. Yeah. Maybe, maybe with a couple of world titles. A couple of world champions, yeah, that'd be yeah. nice. Um, brilliant, and cheers to Simon and Phil as well, and to Tom in the Box for producing. That's our lot for this week. Good luck. <laughs>